please join me in the call to worship? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are good in the morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Let us worship God.
Testament lesson today is from Psalm chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Continuing the reading of God's holy word, you'll find this in the Gospel of John <clears throat> in the second chapter beginning with verse 1 through 12. That's John 2, verses 1 through 12. Here now as we continue to read and to hear God's word as it speaks to us. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out, take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn water knew, the steward called the bridegroom. And he said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Here ends this reading of God's holy word. To his name be glory and praise, both now and forever. Amen. There was a young man, and he was taking a walk. And he was walking through the woods, and he decided to do a little bit of exploring and looking a little bit off the beaten path. And as he was making his journey, he noticed something he'd never seen before. It looked like it was sticking up out of the ground. Shiny object, and so he went over to investigate, and he began to paw at the dirt a little bit, and he realized that it looked like the top of a bottle or something. So he started to dig a little deeper, and he dug it all the way out, and it was sort of a bottle, but more of a jar or a lamp. He couldn't figure out what it was, so he took it home. And he decided he was going to clean it up <clears throat> because it had an antique look to it. And so he goes down to the garage and he gets a couple of rags and some solvent and he starts to clean it up and he's wiping it off and he's rubbing it down. And all of a sudden as he's rubbing this thing, smoke starts to come out of it. And as the smoke comes out of it, he's rubbing it to polish it up. And not only is it smoke, it turns into this mighty genie. And the genie comes out and looks at him. Now, as the genie's looking at him, he's shocked and surprised, as you can imagine. And so he falls down and he's scrambling around on the ground trying to find a, you know, just get his bearings. He's scared. And as he's fumbling around, the genie looks at him and he says, You have three wishes. Oh, he's so panicked, right? Never saw anything like this. So he looks around and he goes, I wish I could find a chair to sit on in. And boom! Just like that, there's one of those big lounge chairs, you know, the recliners, and he's sitting in it, and he's relaxed, and things get quiet for a minute. He looks around, and he's marveling at it, and the genie looks at him, and he says, you now have two wishes. <laughs> now, it hasn't struck him yet, but he's probably squandered the first one, but he's still got two remaining. 
And then it dawns on him, this is incredible. He's got an amazing opportunity. Two wishes from a genie, whatever he wants. Now, you know, I learned something growing up. And actually, I learned this oh, a number of years ago when Eddie, our, our oldest son, was younger. Remember that movie, Aladdin? I learned a little bit about genies from there. I heard Robert, Robin Williams was the genie, remember? And there's one thing about genies that you learn. And the one thing you can't wish for is what? More wishes. Okay? So if you got two, you got two. If you got lucky enough to have three, you're in great shape. But whatever you do, you better use them wisely. Now let me ask you a question. What if right now you had two wishes? Anything you want. What would you wish for? Wave a magic wand. Anything in the world is at your disposal. What would you wish for, huh? The old wish was, I wish for a million dollars. A million dollars doesn't go as far as it used to, does it? And you know what we've learned over the past several years, and certainly over the past several months, is sometimes just throwing money at problems doesn't make them go away. What would you wish for? What would you wish for? Would you wish for peace? I mean, you probably got three of them, right? In fact, I think if you wished for peace, I think they might even extend you a little grace and give you an extra one. You can keep your chair. We'll start over. Peace in the world. I sure hope there's a genie out there that can wave a magic wand because we need that now more than ever. What would you wish for? What desire do you have that could be fulfilled? Be careful because once you use up your wishes, they're gone. Now, it is against that context of that backdrop that I share with you this passage from the scripture today. Because it comes to you from the Gospel of John, the second chapter. This is the first recorded miracle of Jesus. Now, is this the first miracle in the Bible? Not by a long shot. We've been parting the Red Sea and all this kind of stuff. Elijah was bringing people back from the dead. No, but this is the first miracle of Jesus. And it may or may not be his first one. It is the first recorded miracle of Jesus. Jesus is at a wedding. He's not there alone. Who's with him? Well, his mother's there. So obviously this is some sort of family thing. We don't know if he's related to the folks. We know his disciples are, so not only is it a family event, it is a community event. And everybody turned out for the wedding. And weddings in those days are radically different than what we've got now. In spite of that, we think that the celebrations are kind of overblown. They're nothing compared to this. Because as community events, these weddings would be week-long affairs. As I suggested to you, we were using the, the, the book, that Max Licato book, you know, You Are Not Alone, and he talks a little bit about it there and explains how those weddings worked. But they were a week-long event, and they were community-based, and they had generational consequences. Because what happened is everybody remembered your wedding, and they talked about it. And they talked about your family in the context of that wedding. So they are at the wedding. Everything is going fine. And what occurs is we find out is they run out of what? Wine. Now, they had, even in those days, wedding planners. You couldn't put together an event like this without them. They were usually family members and stuff. So the fact is, is that the wedding planners didn't plan very well, did they? One of two things happened. Either they didn't order enough to begin with, or the guests, well, they drank more than they should have. Either way, this thing was going south. And the ramifications to this would be felt by their family for generations to come. Because people would be talking about them and talking behind their back and things and say, do you remember, do you remember Nanette's wedding? Oh yeah, I remember that one. This was a crisis. Out of that crisis, Mary, the mother of Jesus, comes to her son and says what? They're out of wine. 
And Jesus instinctively, immediately does what? I'll run down the store and get some. What does he tell his mother? They have no wine, the mother of Jesus said to him. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern of that is to you or to me? Who cares? What's it got to do with us? They're out of wine and you're bringing this problem to me. What difference does it make? Now there's a reason why I'm guessing that Jesus raised that question. We just spent the season of Advent studying the names of Jesus. Do you remember what they were? The Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Jesus is a pretty important guy. John 2 tells this story. John 3 tells us the purpose of Jesus. What is John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever liveth and believeth in him will never die. What's the next verse? Do you remember? For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but, and here's the most critical part, that the world might be saved through him. Why is Jesus here? He's got to save the world. That's big stuff. I know, but we're out of wine. Seriously? <laughs> this is not my problem. I'm here to save the world. In fact, what does he say? My time is not yet come. He's referring to the cross. You know, we got stuff to do. I'm here for a reason. I am the creator of the universe. You know, I, I, I'm here to be the redeemer and all this stuff. I am the, 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 you know, the, the, the bright morning star. All the, you know. And you're telling me you're out of wine? <laughs> Something's not right here. Why would Jesus care? You know, as we looked at that and as we talked about those passages that we've been studying over the course of Advent, one of the things that we realized is that if Jesus was the wonderful counselor, where did he get all that wisdom and all of that knowledge? Who taught him all those things and brought them to his remembrance? His dad. So his father taught him many things and revealed many things to him. So his father was there to teach him about being God. What was his mother there to do? Do you think maybe his mother taught him something? Do you think maybe, one of the things that is very challenging for us to think about is, is when we think about God as the creator of the universe and the vast knowledge of all that is and was and ever will be, how does God understand what it is to be human? Let me ask you a question. Over the past several months, have you struggled with anything? Have you felt bad? Now, if you look at the world, oh my goodness, watch the news. In fact, don't watch the news. It just breaks your heart. You see everything that's going on in the world, and you see all of the destruction and all the devastation and all of the chaos and all of this, and then you wonder why you feel bad about something, right? It's almost like you shouldn't have a right to do that. You're worried because you can't figure out, you know, your kids don't know how to do their homework. You can't figure out how to adjust to a new job. You don't know how to register for class. You got laid off. You can't figure out how to fill out the unemployment. You're frustrated, you're angry, you're disgusted. And then you see all the other stuff in the world and you think you're almost guilty because you shouldn't be upset by that because my goodness, you're in so much better shape than everybody else. But you're still hurting, correct? You're allowed to hurt. And when you pray to God, you ask God to be present in the midst of that. You ask God to help you. But we're almost afraid to ask God for little stuff anymore. Because God's worried about big stuff. God's got to save the world. So God doesn't have any time to deal with the fact that you're feeling bad. And that you're going through a rough patch. And maybe you're grieving the loss of someone you love. Or maybe you're struggling because you can't go see somebody in the hospital because you've, you've, you've known them your whole life. But that's not important right now. 
Because the creator of the universe is undoubtedly going to look and say, what concern of that is that to you and me? And Jesus' mother looks at him and she says, I'm going to teach you about being human. Because God taught you how to be God. But I'm going to teach you about humans. Because they hurt. And they cry. And they feel pain. And little things do matter. The beauty to the first miracle that Jesus performs, he is not calming the storm. He is not feeding 5,000 people. He is doing something so mundane as what? Making sure they got enough wine for a family wedding. Why should he care? Because if you take anything away from this passage, if you take anything away, God cares. And God cares about you. And he cares about little things. Because little things matter to us and little things matter to God. I was talking to the folks in the Sunday school class today and, and, and I mentioned the question and I asked the question, see if anybody knows this, the shortest verse in the Bible is? Jesus wept. Very good. That's like the Bible trivia thing. I need a Bible quote. I'll give you that one. It's in there twice. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. I'll help you with that. Second time, if you're in Sunday school class, you can't talk. Uh, well, you can, but just not at the moment. You can't answer this one. What other time does Jesus cry? At the death of Lazarus. Does he cry because he is mourning the loss of his friend? No. Because he knows what's going to happen to Lazarus. He's going to bring him back. Because he's God. He's going to do this. That's what he does. So why did he cry? Because he felt the pain and the suffering of Mary and Martha. Because he knows that we cry. And because we deal with the challenges day to day in life, he deals with them. And he knows what hurts. And he is there to wipe away all of those tears. And we don't have to wait for Jesus to come and do miracles on a grand scale. Because sometimes those miracles happen in our daily lives. Because those things matter. Let me tell you a quick story. Some of you folks know, and I've told you stories about that before, so forgive me if I go down this path a bit. But as a hobby, and basically, and this is, you know there's something wrong with you when you keep your sanity because you go out and voluntarily officiate sports. But that's a hobby that I have. And I've done it for probably a dozen, about probably a dozen years by now. And <clears throat> I meet a lot of people that way. And there's a fellow that I know that officiates with us, and he, he, you can either do this as a hobby, which I do. There are some folks that do this and try to make a living doing this. And to do that, they have got to hustle and run their backside off, because there's really no money in it. But if they keep working constantly, they can sustain themselves. And this gentleman, I've known him, he's probably in his late 50s, early 60s, and his other job, he's just a laborer. When I say just a laborer, he doesn't work for anybody. He'll go and help you do demolition work, or he'll dig a hole. He's kind of a day worker. Well, I got a note back in March from the guy, I can use this fellow's name, his name's John, and John is the umpire in chief or in charge, and, and Aaron and Eddie know John, and John's a great guy, and he runs the umpires for this half of the country for one of these organizations. He sends me a note, sends it to everybody. And he says, he tells us about this fella, we all know him by name, and he says, it's March. He says, this guy's struggling because there's no work in March. First off, there's no holes to dig. There's no demolition work to get done. That's okay. He sustained himself. He'd referee basketball games. And stuff. Well, there wasn't any. He says, he's struggling. He said, and so it wasn't like we organized some great fund me thing or anything. He says, if any of you can see fit to help him out. Here's his address. So I remember getting that note last March, and I read it, and I thought to myself, that's a shame. I know the fella, great guy. So I sat down that night and I wrote him a check. Put it in the mail. He doesn't live very far from here. It was over in Irwin. I sent it to him. Didn't think much of it. 
And I just did it because I thought it was a nice thing to do. I didn't do it to make myself feel good because that's sometimes why we help folks because it makes us feel good. I didn't think one way or the other. So off it went. Didn't think anything of it until July. In July, we're working again. And some of us, we didn't work as much as we used to because guys like this needed to work. And so we would defer and give him the work. But I happened to run into him and, and we're over at a ball field up around Indiana County and we're having a hot dog. And he catches me and he walks up to me and he says, Reverend. Now, <laughs> for 12 years he never called me that. And I think the only reason he knew that is because it was said on the check. He said, I need to talk to you. I said, okay, cool. He said, and when somebody tells me that and he calls me that, I'm like, but they, got, they want to talk, you know. So I said, sure, what do you want to talk about? And he says, you know, I got to tell you a story. He says, you need to know this. He says, last March, he says, I was in trouble. He says, I hadn't paid my rent. He said, they will kick me out. He says, I've worked my whole life. He says, I work for everything that I have, and I'm proud of that. He says, I couldn't work. He says, well, I got lucky. I got a call. A friend of mine called me and said they had some demolition work, and it was paying so much by the hour, and it was cash, and they wouldn't even be over there, but it was out by the airport. And I know Aaron's seen this guy's car. I don't think his car could get from Irwin to the airport. But he says, I was going to go to work, but I didn't have any gas. <laughs> I didn't have enough gas to get to the airport. He's not only that, I hadn't eaten in three or four days. He said, now, he said, um, he says, I'm not what I'd call a religious guy. He said, I don't believe in God, but I don't really care. <laughs> he says, now I got to tell you, I haven't said a prayer in years, but I sat down that night and I said a prayer. He said, Lord, if you're there, he says, I need help. And he said, you know what, Reverend? He says, I didn't ask for much. He said, all I needed was $10 worth of gas, a loaf of bread, and a jar of peanut butter. He says, and he says, I went to bed that night, but didn't sleep. He says, next morning I got up and there was a check in the mail from you. He says, I hadn't seen you since last July. He says, that's the last thing I ever thought I'd see. He says, so you know what I did? I went down to the bank, I cashed the check, put $10 worth of gas in my car, and I bought a loaf of bread and a jar of peanut butter. He says, doesn't seem like much, but that's what I needed. And I had enough to do that. And then I went to work. He says, I did my job. And I got paid. I'm back doing this. He says, I'm not setting the world on fire. But I'm getting through this one day at a time. Miracles come in all shapes and sizes. I would hardly call that a miracle story, would you? Because miracles are parting the Red Sea. And miracles are walking on water and feeding 5,000. We're going to talk about some of those miracles in the days to come. Miracles are knowing that God cares about you right now, right where you are. That's a miracle. That the creator of the universe, the Lord of lords, the king of kings, knows you by name and will hear your concerns and supply your needs right now, right then. That there is nothing too small to miss and escape the attention of God. God is there with you. Isn't that what we said when we said, Emmanuel, God is with us? The Lord is with you. What concern is that to me? Everything. Jesus heard that request. Jesus understood at that moment when his mother said that, he had compassion on those folks. Later on when he feeds 5,000 people, did he do it because he was going to put on a great show? It tells us he looked at the crowd and he had compassion on them. He cared for them. It's not so much what miracles God does, but why God does them. Those blessings, those miracles are done because God loves you. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, and no matter how simple it seems to be. You are never alone. 
God will walk with you all the days of your life. And yes, the Lord has come to redeem the world, to save the world, to grant those wishes and to figure out how to get out of the mess that we're living in now. But in the midst of that, God will not forget you. There is no request too small. If there is anything to take away from the miracles of Jesus Christ, it is knowing that God knows our every desire, every need, that he will supply those needs. He will hear our prayers and always be present with us. Amen. is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and heard and received do, and the God of peace will be with you. In the name of the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you.